you'd be very, very afraid. Wait, I mean, still be very, very afraid. Remember the surge in Iraq? That was going to be the solution to all of our problems. The surge, the surge is coming. Well, now it's a new kind of surge, a surge in cases. This time, among the young, endangering older adults. Today's top story from the Associated Press, virus cases surge among the young, endangering older adults. So, Coronaviruses are climbing rapidly among young adults in a number of states where bars, stores, and restaurants have reopened. <gasps> Be afraid of reopening. A disturbing generational shift that not only puts them in greater peril than many realize, but poses an even bigger danger to older people who cross their paths. Don't you love that? Like, cross, don't, don't cross the path of a young person infected with coronavirus. In Oxford, Mississippi, summer fraternity parties sparked outbreaks. In Oklahoma City, church activities, fitness classes, weddings and funerals seeded infections among people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. In Iowa College Town, surges followed the reopenings of bars. A cluster of hangouts near Louisiana State University led to at least 100 customers and employees testing positive. In East Lansing, Michigan, an outbreak tied to a brew pub spread to 34 people, ages 18 to 23. There, and in states like Florida, Texas, and Arizona, young people have started going out again, many without masks and what health experts see as irresponsible behavior without masks. Well, then there's the opposite side of the spectrum, right? We saw, Jim, just yesterday, even here in Ashford, although it might have been, to be, to be fair, it might have been, the uh, it might might have been someone from out of town just passing through on the forty who uh, who's, who decided that they they really needed to be wearing their mask while driving around their around the gap like I oh my don't be afraid be very afraid as Ali Mokhtar, professor of health metric sciences at the University of Washington said the university hasn't changed we have changed our behaviors younger people are more likely to be out and taking a risk in Florida. Young people ages 15 to 34 now make up 31% of all cases, up from 25% in early June last week. More than 8,000 new cases were reported in that age group compared with about 2,000 among people 55 to 64. And experts say the phenomenon cannot be explained away as simply the result of more testing. Now, <laughs> well, if the experts say that that's true, it must be true. More quotes from authorities in the story. Elected officials such as Florida's governor have argued against reimposing restrictions, saying many of the newly infected are young and otherwise healthy, but younger people too face the possibility of severe infection and death. In the past week, two 17-year-olds in Florida died of the virus, and authorities worry that older, more vulnerable people are next. You know, when, when they... See that you see the media oftentimes accuse Fox News of being biased, and, and of course they are, but of dishonest journalism in their biases, where they use these weasel phrases. Well, pe people say, experts say, authorities say. Well, I I heard somebody say, and it's just this this, this way of introducing an idea with, without really substantiating it or giving it any credibility, and you know to hear. The, uh, the, the the Associated Press, you know, use this. Uh, the virus has taken a frightful toll on older people. For months, older adults were more likely to be diagnosed with the virus, too. But figures from the CDC show that almost as soon as states began reopening, the picture flipped with people 18 to 49 quickly becoming the age bracket most likely to be diagnosed with new cases. So. Uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis warned other bars they could lose their licenses if they don't follow social distancing guidelines. What's the point of going to a bar with social distance? I mean, like I, I, I get some people go to bars for the the intellectual conversation, but you know we're talking about an establishment that's that's designed to make people want to hook up. And if you go and you don't want to hook, like what? What are you do? What are you doing at a bar, observing social? Obviously, there's there's something. Uh, there's a new wave of fear 
so they can impose new consequences. And I hate, again, man, I hate to say I told you so again and again and again. But yeah, once they've introduced and gotten people to accept the premise of the fear mongering, they can manipulate the data, the statistics, and scare you into another wave of lockdowns. Now, whether this turns into a bigger escalation of the forced unemployment crisis, hard to say, but it's definitely a continuation that's making it hard for a lot of people. The cure is still worse than the disease. And I hate to have to go over this, you know, as the mainstream media pumps out more and more fear. But this is what is being used to manipulate your fellow Americans, people around the world. And it's going to affect you negatively. You have to be now, as long as they're staying on the fear, we have to keep dispelling this fear. What's it being used for? Our next story from Fox 5 New York. New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut order quarantine for visitors from states with high infection numbers. The governors of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are ordering a mandatory 14-day quarantine on visitors from states with a high number of COVID-19 cases. They made the announcement on Wednesday morning during a joint news conference. The travel advisory is effective starting Thursday. Because, you know, the virus doesn't really get going until the weekend. And it normally makes it, a, you know, it starts really early. It's kind of like a college weekend. It starts with your last class on Thursday and goes until your first class Monday morning when you stumble in hungover. That, that's how the virus operates, obviously. You know, th these arbitrary controls just show you how ridiculous these attempts are at, at uh, it, 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 you know, mitigating the effects of this relatively minor health crisis. The formula announced to make up the list includes states with an infection rate of 10 per 100,000 on a seven-day rolling average or 10% of the total population positive on a seven-day rolling average. Oh, yeah, that's 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 how we determine. That makes makes a lot of sense. The travel advisory impacted or the impacted states from the travel advisory include Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Washington, Utah and Texas. Confused yet? Good. You should be because that's kind of the point. Right. They don't want you to go. Oh, so this is what we're all doing. We have a unified plan. It all makes sense. Everybody can pull together and, and be a part of helping mitigate the effects. No, 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 that's not it. They want you to be confused. Hey, well, we, we can't just shut down travel in between states in the U.S. and make it more of a government-controlled phenomena. So let's come up with a, with a confusing formula and some arbitrary metrics on, on you know, how we decide we're going to limit Americans' travel throughout this country. So to the next story from... NBCNewYork.com, it gets worse. Dry state to require visitors from COVID hotspots to quarantine. So again, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, self-quarantine for travelers from states that hit a spe specific level. So are, are they banning people? Or are, are they, you know, uh, are, are they saying come in, but just then be alone for 14 days? Remember, this is Texas uh, tried this uh, earlier on. And, and, and gave it up for a lot of reasons of it being impractical. But now we have it happening again in a way that, uh, that so, this is, so this is funny, because this is taking effect on Wednesday, today. Uh, the order which went into effect, I'm sorry, yesterday. The order which went into effect at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time Wednesday does not block people from traveling, but it does make clear if, you, that you, if you've been in a state that meets the guidelines, like taking a vacation to Florida and then coming home or visiting New York from Texas on business, you will have to quarantine for 14 days on arriving. Airports and highways will have reminder signs and hotels will be asked to inform guests as well. Part of the story, what they're threatening for a lot of these things are $1,000 fines uh, for states that are, are suggesting making masks mandatory. And, and this is happening. Where did we see this? The, the proposed in Arizona, some city, cities, some states looking at this, saying, you know, $1,000 fines. Well, we're not going to go out and actively enforce it. But if, a, if you, you know, go into a business without a mask on and the owner has a problem, they can now call the police and say, you know, we're, we're going to arrest you for trespassing. So if you're confused, that's the point. And, you know, do we travel? Should we travel? Like, can we travel? 
we have the Libertarian National Convention coming up in, in less than two weeks. You know, what, what are we going to do about it? Like, I don't know. It, you know, we jumping ahead here, the uh, Democrats, and this is from the Associated Press, confirmed plans for nearly all virtual convention. They got a wonderful picture here of Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, with his fancy all black mask. You think he'd he'd put something on it to make a statement? I guess the statement is, "I'm an idiot." That's all you need without wearing a mask the, the way that he is. Now, I get it with the mask. If you're, and again, this is this is the government guidelines. You wear them to limit your projection of spittle, of particulate matter that comes from coughing or sneezing. It's not an effective protection even. You know, we, we saw there's a picture of a guy wearing a dust mask or wearing the N95 mask in a construction environment where they're doing drywall and he's got like white powder. It, it seeps in, it gets, if it's particulate viruses in the air, the mask, you know, really insignificant protection there, if anything, more harm than good for a lot of people who have issues with the masks. And if it makes you more likely to touch your face after touching surfaces that have the virus on them, which can survive on services for, I don't know, up to three days, if you believe the statistics. You're more likely to get it if you're touching your face after touching those surfaces. If you're constantly adjusting your mask, you're going to have a bad time. So Democrats will hold an almost entirely virtual presidential nominating convention August 17 to 20 in Milwaukee using live broadcasts and online streaming. Joe Biden plans to accept the presidential nomination in person but it remains to be seen whether there will be a significant in-person audience there to see it. The DNC said in a statement that official business, including the votes to nominate Biden and is yet to be named running mate, will take place virtually with delegates being asked not to travel to Milwaukee. Well, then I guess you can't have protests outside the convention if there isn't really much of a convention there. Maybe there will be more protests than a convention. So back to the stories about what's actually happening right now with the bigger policy. We go to BloombergTax.com, which you think would be a policy website for the very botched Bloomberg presidential campaign uh, that is fortunately no longer with us. But no, this article, botched testing, $1,200 for the dead, watchdog audits virus plan. So apparently... The federal government's quick action to issue stimulus payments in the wake of the coronavirus crisis led to more than a billion dollars of fraudulent payments, while slow action to address the health risks might have worsened the outbreak, according to a report by a government watchdog. Now, you know, we've talked about what the response would look like without government, basically all the good stuff without any of the crappy stuff, right? we would have better sharing of information. We'd have people coming together. We'd have a better understanding of the virus. We would have people working together to protect those who are vulnerable and elderly populations and create better voluntary means of mitigating risk and allowing people to decide their own level of risk. You wouldn't have the government reducing the flow of information by ordering certain things to be done in secret. You wouldn't have the impediments to the medical industry responding. You wouldn't have the forced lockdown, which is actually bad for the medical industry. And you wouldn't have Donald Trump telling his people, slow down the test. It's making us look bad. We have too many positive cases. So still, the government has yet to spend much of the $2.6 trillion that Congress has approved for the coronavirus response. So far, only $643 billion has gone to the six largest programs, which include the corporate bailout fund small business loans, and funding for healthcare providers. The report is the most comprehensive assessment to date of the government's efforts to combat the health and economic consequences of the pandemic. Here are the takeaways. Testing failures bedevil the U.S. Despite President Donald Trump's boasts about the U.S. leading the world in testing, the GAO found that the CDC reported incomplete and inconsistent data on viral testing from state and local health departments. That made it more difficult to track and mitigate infections and guide decisions about reopening communities. By the way, in the other article, the first one we talked about from the AP about surges in young cases, the AP even had to note that people who are analyzing these statistics are calling for better data. Like, hello, uh, we, you know, the, again, you die of a bullshit. Uh, uh, no, that wasn't gunshot. 
I didn't even say the S word in there. I caught myself, but it was a total slip. I was just trying to say gunshot. Like we saw the case in Seattle, guy died from a gunshot wound to the head. They counted as a coronavirus death. And, and all of these things where they go, well, it looks like this. It looks like this. Look at all these cases. Well, but there's this many dead. We know you can't dispute the death statistics. Yeah, you can. Uh, IRS should contact relatives of deceased. The IRS issued about 1.1 million economic stimulus payments worth $1.4 billion, $1.4 billion to people who have recently died, which largely went to their next of kin. The IRS said that the recipients of those payments should return the money but many people may be unaware that they are required to do so. PPP is still a black box. That's the Paycheck Protection Program. The GAO said it encountered the most difficulty trying to obtain information from the Small Business Administration, which has overseen the approval of more than $4.7 million forgivable Paycheck Protection Program loans totaling $516.5 billion. And, you know, the government, just the language on this, Hey, this, it's a forgivable loan from the government. That's a grant. But can, just, can you not, even in this, like, can you not just be honest in the language? Okay, unemployment insurance and fraud. There's likely to be billions of dollars in unemployment insurance fraud this fiscal year as unemployment claims have surged to more than 42 million, up from 5.1 million last year when there was $2.7 billion worth of fraudulent payments. That's, so by the way, huh, hey, as we're, as we're looking at the coronavirus response, we also discover on a regular basis, the government is losing $2.7 billion worth of fraudulent payments in unemployment. HHS hasn't spent much on vaccine. The Department of Health and Human Services has only spent $18 million of the nearly $5.5 billion ad allocated for vaccine and therapeutics. Do you think that had anything to do with Trump telling his people slow down the testing? Maybe. Uh, slow down the vaccine too? Why not? Well, we're benefiting so we're profiting so much from this. As, as Fauci said, he was cautiously optimistic that a vaccine could be available by the end of the year. There are several candidates, vaccine candidates, nearing readiness for trials including the one by biotech firm Moderna Inc. that is expected to be tested on 30,000 people starting in early J July. Uh, pandemic air travel could drastically change. Uh, the GAO is, is urging Congress to mandate that the Department of Transportation create a plan for passenger and cargo airlines to prevent the spread of disease from abroad after department officials said it wasn't their job. Yeah. So now, what again, ego, you know, what is, what is this all about? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And there, there are a few more wrinkles to this and how the businesses, uh, you know, who were able to anticipate uh, what was going on, were able to create more and more golden parachutes and, and get people, uh, we saw, remember this? Well, not often remembered story. We covered this. As the as the coronavirus was was becoming a thing in March, you remember this, Jim? It was there was all the CEOs who would quit, or 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 you know it, when a CEO quits, or you know or resigns, it's because there's a giant compensation package waiting for them. So to FoxBusiness.com, Hertz doled out sixteen million dollars in bonuses to top executives days before bankruptcy filing. Hertz said it gave $700,000 to newly instated CEO Paul Stone. Sounds like a pretty sweet gig if you ask me. Hertz paid out millions of dollars in retention bonuses to its top executives just days before it filed for bankruptcy and shortly after it laid off thousands of workers. The beleaguered car rental company disclosed in a Securities and Exchange Commission filing on Tuesday that it agreed to pay 16.2 million in cash bonuses to about 340 employees in recognition of the uncertainty the company and its employees face as the coronavirus pandemic wrecks the global travel industry. It also cited the substantial additional efforts undertaken by the employees with a reduced workforce in the midst of an extremely challenging business environment. So, uh, oh, by the way, Hertz did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Surprise, surprise. And just to point this out as a, you know, another 
feature of corporatism where the American people lose out to those who are taking advantage of the system. This is kind of how it's set up. And this is one more thing that's getting worse with coronavirus, this kind of corporate manipulation. Surprise, surprise. They're finding the cash to bail out the individuals in the uh, in, in the executive offices, you know, the 340 top of them. Maybe they're expanding. You know, screw the lower level employees still, but let's make sure we take care of all of the management. Um, by the way, J.C. Penney, which filed for bankruptcy May 15, similarly disclosed in a regulatory filing that it gave gave seventy five million dollars to four top executives, four and a half million dollars for CEO Jill Soltau, and a million apiece for CFO Chief uh, Bao Bao, Whatever you know, since the virus outbreak gained a foothold in the U.S. in mid March, prompting a broad swath of the nation's economic uh, nation's economy to shut down, Hertz has furloughed and laid off about twenty thousand workers or roughly 50% of its workforce, according to the filing. Now, I just want to redirect your attention to the people who are really suffering the most right now. And it's not most of the people with the virus. Yes, there are a handful of people with the virus who, who are genuinely suffering as a result of that. And I say handful as in, yes, I recognize that it might be legitimately in the uh, you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, although even there, the data, the, the, the actual evidence is is so scant that you're, it, you know, it really, it really stretches credulity here that you go, eh, no, I, I, I don't buy it. But you know what I do see when I hear, what, 42 million jobless claims? I see the unemployment rates skyrocketing. It's the servers, the bartenders, the strippers, the drivers, everybody who's out of work right now. We are, we are in a new age of a different kind of war. And this is, this is economic warfare. You know, this is a war declared by the, you know, I should say, an undeclared war by those who can take advantage of this against those of us who can't. Those of the, those who are tied into the system who can say, Haha, well, I'll get my million dollar golden parachute and I'm out of here. Or I'll get I'll get my new fancy government grant or job or, or whatever it is. And I, I man, I, I can't say it enough. This is all set up so the poor get poorer, the rich get richer. I I want people who who are watching this, who, who are who are listening to me today. To really get the, the scope of this. And, you know, when it comes to, to, to all out shooting wars, like you compare, compare this to, say, even Vietnam, right? And all the economic manipulations around that. You know, you go back to World War II, maybe something of a bigger scale that affected more of the American people. Uh, but even like Iraq and Afghanistan, you, know, you can't just spend tens of trillions of dollars on war and not have economic consequences at home. Not only with soldiers and, and you know combat veterans from all branches coming back, becoming cops. You know, kind of an underwritten or un underreported story, Jim. I think of the, the, the whole uh, Black Lives Matter police brutality thing going on right now. It's not being taught. How many of these cops are veterans with PTSD who just came home from combat and the government says, hey, you like carrying a gun for a job? We got another. We got we got some more work for you. Uh, and how many of these guys, when they're dealing with with criminal criminals on uh, quote unquote on U.S. streets, are in the same mentality that they were patrolling the streets in Iraq? Iraqi lives matter, <laughs> not to the U.S. military. I can tell you that from experience. If you if, if I had died in Iraq, my family would have gotten. Do you know this number, Jim? Four hundred thousand dollars. Well, this is back from two thousand four. It's probably it's probably more now, right? If, you know, billionaire. SGLI, Service Members Group Life Insurance. I remember I you check a little box. You know, everybody signs up for the military. What happens if we kill an Iraqi? Well, if it's tracked and it's traceable, and and we know the family, and and we feel you know that that, that it would be in the best interest of the military occupation of Iraq to to calm them down and maybe maybe stop them from becoming insurgents, we, we would go as our civil affairs team 
and go and meet with the families and say, oh, here's your salatia bean. Now, salatia, S-O-L-A-T-I-A, not a very often used word. It's not a, we're sorry we killed your family member because we're not saying we're sorry. We're not taking responsibility. It's solace. We are, we are offering solace for, for your loss. $2,400. Twenty-four. You walk around a rock in uniform and you go, my life is worth $400,000. This Iraqi's life is worth $2,400. Oh, if I have to put my knee on his neck and he dies while we're holding this position, huh, all right, we'll just put it in the report as an, a, another, 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 uh, another Iraqi national kill. No, no big deal. Just another statistic. Well, guess what? As we see the bifurcation of the U.S. economy from the red-white market and the black market, we also see the same split in terms of whose lives actually matter in the United States. And yes, I support the core message of Black Lives Matter because the system in many ways operates in ways in which it doesn't. And I'm not here to go, oh, but all lives matter. Let's pretend There's a, there is a bigger problem related to this. And I don't mean to say this to demean Black Lives Matter at all, because Black Lives are certainly mostly in this category. Although there's some, the, the white power structure has allowed some blacks, you know, Colin Powell, uh, Condoleezza Rice, just for a few, you know, the, uh, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Kanye, I, I mean, I'm, Suge Knight, right? You know, there, there are some others here, uh, blacks in America who are now in the, in the favored class, so to speak. But yeah, this is the war. What's your life worth to government? Eh, $1,200 a month. What's, what's the corporate CEO worth? A million dollars a year. A congressman, a bureaucrat, someone whose job is secure in this forced unemployment crisis. Now, I'm excited. I'm, I'm still, I'm going to say excited. Um, I'm still encouraged that the shooting wars are no longer the best rackets for government. The virus propaganda, forced unemployment, economic war. This is it now. So we don't have to fight with guns. We fight with words. We fight with the truth. We fight with our actions. By withdrawing our support from the system, by being more conscientious in how you live and what you do, living agorist, taking your economic affairs out of the supervision of government, somewhere they can't be taxed, where you're not materially supporting government, reconsidering your life from the ground up, being more conscientious about where you live. And I don't just mean what part of the world, what country or what area, do you live in a city? Do you live on land that you own like we do here? Do you live on a grid where if the government, you know, this is already happening, I'm not, I'm not raising some new fear specter here, right? The government has started cutting off water and electricity. Now, the government, certain city governments in the United States have done this to businesses that are not observing the shutdown protocol. Well, what if you're not as an individual? Thank you, that's your house too. Because your life, doesn't matter if you're on the wrong side of this war for them. And for humanity, this is the right side of the war. What we're doing here at the Garden of Freedom, I've said, is leading the most important march for freedom in the world right now. Out of the cities and into the streets where there's, or excuse me, <laughs> out of the cities and into the streets, out of the cities and into the woods where there's plenty of freedom to go around. I do feel now like we are in a state of war. I think it will pass. And the wrong side will lose and the people will win. With your help, raising the consciousness and sharing this message as best you can.